what's going on guys it's last call which means we're talking pre-foc and boy do we have a list of books for you and it's coming up after this What's going on guys, it's Brian with Superman's Comics, and this is the last call show. We're talking pre-FOC, final, pre-final order cutoff, it's Friday night. We're recording this Thursday night, but we're still enjoying the Friday night adult Kool-Aids, so kudos to you guys. Grab that bar stool, come up to the bar while we talk about some of these books, but before we do so, let me introduce my co-host, Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. Cheers, bud. Absolutely. Cheers, Brian. Thank you for having me. As always, as Brian said, I'm Jack Mayo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, and this is the pre-FOC show, The Last Call. This is my favorite show of the week um, where we get to ruffle a little feathers but help out collectors, and that is the goal of this channel. So I'm ready, like you said in the intro. We've got a great list this week. Right, and to kick that list off, we are going with Green Lantern, Black Stars, number one. This is Grant Morrison writing. It's Zermanico, Zermanico on art. But we also have covers from Liam Sharp. This is also going to have a variant by Derek Robertson. Right. Now, Derek Robertson, you may um, be familiar with. Uh, he is the artist who was behind the hit image series Happy, which ended up on the Sci-Fi Network. Um, and... Brian, both you and I are big Green Lantern fans, so I know that this is one that's on our radar. Forget about the speculation on this, just from a reading standpoint. Um, I've also been very open saying, and I may get shot for this, that I'm not a big Grant Morrison fan. So I wasn't big on the Rebirth uh, Green Lantern series, the Hal Jordan series, but it won me over over time. I got on it late, and I'm excited for this Black Star series. So this picks up right after issue 12. It's going to be the finale to that whole Grant Morrison run. And what's peculiar about this is there's no power rings right now, correct? Right. No power rings, no Green Lanterns patrolling the universe. Um, and we are going to see some of our kind of most beloved, I'd say, heroes in a different capacity. And this solicit uh, in this book asks the question and hopefully will answer it. Who are the Black Stars? Right, and they're also saying that in this, the Green Lantern Corps never even existed. Yep. So, definitely one that Jack and I are high on, even if it's just from a reader perspective. Both of us are big Green Lantern fans, so we have this in our FOC list this week. So make sure if you want this, you get your orders in for any of these books we're talking about by this coming Monday night at 10 p.m. That's when Diamond cuts his orders off. And the majority of these books we're talking about will be releasing 23 days from Monday, which is November 6th. So here we are talking about Vengeance of Vampirella number two. Vampirella has her own little cult following, but the reason why we have this, especially in this FOC, is there's two variants for it that we really like, and that is the Lucio Prio, which is also the cover A, as well as the Ben Oliver. They have virgin variants for these. That's what I'm liking, but what do you think, Jack? Yeah, I agree. That uh, Lucio Perillo virgin variant um, catches my eye right off the bat for some obvious reasons, but you know, there's a long history with Perio and Dynamite Virgin variants really gaining steam on the secondary market over time. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out for. Also, there's a high buy-in price for those. So that tends to scare some people off, which can limit quantities on them. So I think you mentioned it, cult popular characters, great cover art, popular cover artists. It's kind of a recipe for success. So it's not for everybody, but We'd be remiss not to mention it, not to bring it up, because there's certainly a uh, group and sector of collectors that they really, really jump on these type of releases. Right. Also, keep in mind that there most likely will be some store exclusives for those. Keep an eye out for those in case you're interested in those covers as well. X-Force number one. We're getting a lot of number ones. We just recently got X-Men number one. But here we are kicking off a brand new X-Force. We have Benjamin Piercy writing. We have 
covers from a bunch of different people. We got a Dustin Weaver cover. We got a Russell Dodeman variant. We have a Ji Hyung Lee variant. We have fucking that up already. That Ji Hyung Lee is his, right? Yeah. Yeah. So here we have X-Force number one. We're getting a lot of number ones for Marvel, especially with the X family, with kicking off out of Powers of X and House of X. But this is going to have a bunch of different covers for it. You got Dustin Weaver doing the regular cover. But this is also going to have a Hidden Gem variant. There's a Mark Bagley Every Mutant variant. There's a Jonathan Hickman Design variant. A Young Guns variant. As well as our channel sponsor, Frankie'sComics.com. He has that great X-23 G Hung Lee variant. What do you think about this, Jack? Well, I'm actually excited for the series. We talked about how the key for Powers of X and House of X was going to be how do they successfully spin off into individual mutant teams. Now, there's a lot of them. And both you and I kind of were very honest with the community saying we're a little concerned about that. But the one of the few books that I think has almost no chance of not being successful is this X-Force book. I think X-Force, X-Men... I think those are solid bets, and I'm actually more excited about this X-Force book than I've been for another X-Force book in a long time, um, and it's really written in the solicit, the way that this team is set up and organized. Um, they say that X-Force is the CIA of the mutant world, one half intelligence branch, one half special ops, uh, with Beast, Jean Grey, and Sage on one side, and Wolverine, Kid Omega, and Domino on the other. Um, in a perfect world, there'd be no need for the X-Force, but we're not there yet. Um, and this first arc is, you know, the high price of a new dawn, as we know that the, a new dawn of X um, is the big lingering approaching kind of next chapter in this giant mutant story. Um, great cover art. The story sounds interesting. Um, and again, big shout out to Kevin Fields at Frankie's Comics for that uh, excellent X-23 variant where, you know, originally a lot of people brought up that the pose to his previous x-23 variant was similar to one that he had released before but they hadn't looked ahead to this x-force variant where you get that reverse imagery and it's just another unique collectible created by frankie's comics um so great set to put together and uh one i think between the x-men and the x-force book are kind of must have for x collectors Legion of Superheroes number one. Marvel might have Donny Cates, but it seems like DC has Brian Michael Bendis, of course. Seems to be writing all these freaking titles, and this is one that we're interested in as well. There's going to have four different covers for it. There's the regular cover. There's two different cardstock variants as well as a blank variant for this. Right, and obviously here we're looking at um, the heroes of the 31st century. Um, Legion of Superheroes is a really ambitious book. has a ton of heroes, some new, some old. Um, and we've got Jonathan Kent, for instance, being inducted into the Legion, taking the reins as it appears as Superman. And this, this series is important for a few reasons. Number one, you mentioned Brian Michael Bendis. This was the book he was like the most excited to take over and to do something with when he took the, the reins at DC Comics as kind of like, yeah, their go-to guy. Um, secondly, we get to see some aging up of stars, which is something we've talked about on the channel before with like Jonathan Kent being kind of front and center. Um, also, we know that there are some ma major rumors in the market right now of this DC Comics 5G program, uh, meaning the fifth generation, the next generation of main characters. And Brian and I were just talking before we got on the mic that that Young Justice series is probably back issue gold to mine for those kinds of characters. And I think that you could quite possibly see some of those characters in action through this series. Also, there's going to be some new characters. And uh, one that we have highlighted before on Instagram is Monster Boy. Uh, Monster Boy is actually based on, believe it or not, Boom Studios VP of Marketing Arun Singh, who we've had on the channel and we talk about frequently, um, who did some work with Brian Michael Bendis, and Brian Michael Bendis wanted to create a character based upon him. So there is going to be some, you know, some new life and some new blood um, in this series, and it'll be something to pay attention to. Um, I've never been a Legion of Superheroes fan. It's never been a series I've paid attention to, but this reboot is kind of being made into such a big deal that it's one I will be all over. And those Millennium Legion of Superheroes um, kind of lead-ins, they were underwhelming in the market. People didn't pay attention to them, and now may be the time to go back and grab them.
So here we have Pandemica number two. This is from IDW. It's no stranger. Jack and I like some of these IDW books, but this one in particular, we've had this one. We've talked, we've talked about this title before. Here we have issue number two. Jonathan Mayberry, New York best-selling author, great with horror. This is gonna have the regular cover as well as a one in ten incentive. Both of them are by Alex Sanchez. Don't have the art for that incentive right now, but we're pretty sure it's just gonna be like a black and white, similar to issue number one right and this book to me is all about reader buzz jonathan mayberry as you mentioned you know he's a new york times best-selling writer and he's had kind of like that golden touch for getting his books adapted uh v wars is coming very soon to netflix and the reason why we like this book is in reading the solicit it just seemed like the type of thing that was ready for adaptation and issue number two continues this story and seems to look like it's going to progress it uh it's called sick things um, it's talking about the ethnic genocide, uh, bioweapons um, have been released, people are dying in the streets, but there are worse things than death. Designer pandemics are colliding and mutating, pushing humanity to the edge of permanent darkness. One child holds the key to humanity or extinction, and everyone is hunting for her. And so this is the type of story, a little bit of horror, a little bit of suspense, a little bit of drama. And it's, it's the kind of thing that seems ready for adaptation. I like the fact that there's only a cover A and then a 1 in 10. I think that that kind of bodes well for the long-term success. I don't see this one being hugely printed, especially as we get into the later issues in the series. Um, and it's something to keep an eye out for, especially the possibility. And this isn't often talked about um, in the speculation community. And again, this is just pure spec here. Um, sometimes characters don't all appear in issue number one, but in in – Indie series is people tend to grab issue number one and forget about everything else. So it's something to pay attention to as we go into issues two, three, and four, if you are speculating on this for a kind of media option at some point. So we've talked before on this channel how Marvel's been kicking up with those anime style books with Agents of Atlas and so on, Swordmaster, but here we have another one with Future Fight First, Crescent and Eo number one. This is going to have five different covers for it. You're going to have the regular cover. You're going to have the, before I keep going, forgive me if I butcher some of these names, but you're going to have a Yang Jun Cho Net Marble variant. You're going to have a Ji Hyung Lee variant. There's it also that Enhyak Lee Virgin variant, as well as the Sana Takeda Marvelous Futures Avengers variant. Right, and now we were kind of uh, skeptical with the White Fox Future First uh, Future Fight release, um, but because of the success of that book, I think that this really is a book that we've got to pay attention to, um, being this Crescent and EO book. Now, here's the thing, or IO, I don't, I don't know which one it is, but. Um, this is a character that spins out of that New Agents of Atlas book, which, again, I think is about as solid of an investment long term. I don't care about the double shipping or anything like that. The amount of first appearances that are now continuing to get published in other books um, is really kind of staggering. But the, the, you're talking about a 10-year-old Korean superhero here. Um, so there's a lot of room uh, for kind of like success in the secondary market based on adaptation, based on, op, uh, you know, not really optioning, but Marvel using these characters as they go into these um, kind of Asian-based storylines that we expect to see coming in the future, trying to kind of tap into that Asian market. But also, here's the big thing. You got to kind of follow patterns. Speculators tend to follow patterns. Um, and this, this is one, like, Certain collectors will want this book, but I, I really expect this to get the attention of collectors with that In Yuck Lee 1 in 100 variant that, Brian, you just mentioned. Um, we just saw that last one go for, I think, last sale was like $350. Now there's none listed on eBay. How many stores are going to order 100 copies of this book? I don't imagine a lot. And that will make the supply of the 100 variant very limited, and I imagine we're going to see similar pricing. Right, and if you guys are reading these titles, let us know in the comments. What do you think about these? I'm not a big anime fan, but I have picked up Agents of Atlas. I picked up uh, the first Swordmaster. I picked up the first Arrow. So I've been giving those a read, trying to sway my opinion. I'm sure I'll pick this one up as, as well. See if I can get into it. But either way, let us know in the comments. Are you picking this book up? Is this something that you guys are interested in? Is Marvel being successful with this anime-style push? We're interested to know. 
want to hear from you guys as well. And while you're doing that, do us a favor and click that thumbs up button for us. And if this is your first time watching this show, please consider subscribing. Getting back over to the indie comics. This one's from Vault Comics with Heist, How to Steal a Planet number one. I'm interested in this book. Me being an 80s guy with my 80s movie references, looking at the solicit for this, it kind of reminds me of that old 80s movie, Ice Pirates. But this is going to have a regular cover as well as a classic Vault Vintage Homage cover. But I think I'm aware of one more cover for this as well. Right, that's not all, but we have a CBSI comicbookinvest.com vault vintage retailer exclusive variant homaging Jack Kirby's uh, Eternals number one. Um, it's will be available very soon in comicbookinvest.com. Head to comicbookinvest.com, hit that variants tab. We will be announcing the release date very soon on social media. But this is a series that we immediately got excited upon about upon checking out the solicit. Um, it talks about some people try to steal money, some like jewels, some like cars, others go big, like stealing a planet. And that's what Glenn Barreld uh, is plotting to do with his gang of thieves. In Heist, How to Steal a Planet, number one, the planet heist is the target and the only the most cunning criminals can pull off a stunt this big. And, you know, this comes from Paul, like you said, Paul Tobin, who did uh, Planets vs. Zombies. We've got um, the colors behind these savage shores. So there's um, kind of like an in-house feel there. And this has been described, you mentioned a little 80s reference, but it's been described as Ocean's Eleven in space with a little science fiction kind of twist to it. So it's definitely something that uh, any of you kind of like heist fans are going to like it, and it's right there in the title. Yeah, they're wrong. It's Ice Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if they're vaults any good as any good with this as they all with their other space comic and wasted space i'm definitely all in on this because wasted space is fantastic can't wait to read this as well right and it's important to note too we meant you mentioned that cover b it's a love and rockets uh vault vintage variant homage which is a real popular kind of cult classic independent comic so it's kind of cool to see an indie comic homaging another indie comic As we mentioned earlier in this show, Marvel's kicking off new number one, especially with these mutant books and X-Men number one, X-Force number one. Now we got new mutants number one. This is going to have covers by Rod Rice, Mark Bagley, Art Germ, Nick Bradshaw, and Javier Guerin. Right, and the new generation claims the dawn. Again, we see that dawn word again. The classic new mutants, Sunspot, Wolfsbane, Mirage, Karma, Magic, and Cypher. Get together with a few friends, Chamber, Mondo, to seek out their missing member and share the good news, a mission that takes us into the space alongside the Star Jammers. So the thing that for me that's maybe more exciting about this book is the fact that it's written by Jonathan Hickman. So I mentioned that X-Force and X-Men were the two that I felt like were solid X books. And this one is the one that I would probably put as that like next opportunity um, to be successful um, I think the fact that Jonathan Hickman's attached to it bodes really well. Um, and I know he's covering kind of the whole X universe as a whole, but the fact that he's directly working on this book, I think works, um, to its advantage, especially from a speculation perspective, as people are at this point, very accustomed to reading his books coming out of house of X and powers of X. Um, there's also going to be, this is one of those books that I expect if it does well, there's going to be a lot of back issues that are going to come into attention as a lot of those characters, whether it's Mondo or chamber from that generation X run or uncanny X-Men one Oh four, the first appearance of star jammers. Those are all books that I could see becoming popular with uh, collectors and speculators alike. If they read this series and really kind of dig it. And of course you mentioned that art germ variant. I think that's, what's going to get a lot of attention, a lot of posts on Instagram. Yeah. You're going to get a lot of posts. There's a, there's a store exclusive out there floating around, Derek Chu store exclusive as well. So if you're interested and if you're a Derek Chu fan, make sure you guys search out for that. Um, art germ, and it's weird because some art germs really pop now and then some kind of fizzle out. 
We've talked about Archer and Fatigue before. Still a brilliant artist, but no doubt that variant will have its following for sure. So kicking on over to Image Comics real quick, we have Undiscovered Country number one. This is a book that a lot of people are already aware of, but it's hitting FOC Monday night. It's going to have that regular cover, but it also has a variant for it by Jock, as well as a bunch of store exclusives already floating around out there, as well as some of those you've seen those preview and ash can editions floating at Comic-Cons. Jack, tell us more about this book. Well, in this first special oversized issue, readers will journey into the near future and an unknown nation that was once the United States of America, a land that's become shrouded in mystery after walling itself off from the rest of the world without explanation over 30 years ago. When a team seeking a cure for a global pandemic breaches U.S. borders, they quickly find themselves in a struggle to survive with a strange and deadly lost continent. Um, so, yeah, this book has already been optioned. There's just an incredible amount of buzz on this book. So you would think that, Brian, you and I would be here and we'd be kind of very excited for this one, right? But you mentioned a couple things. Um, the first thing I'm going to bring up is the variants that already exist. There are already three variants that exist on the market. We've got a San Diego Comic-Con ash can. We've got a NYCC black and white sketch version. And we've got a NYCC foil version. So my kind of trepidation with being too excited about this book is are, is the books that are going to come out, the Jock FOC variant, the cover A, are those even going to be the ones that people really want? Or when this book, it's already been optioned, but when it inevitably gets kind of put into production, are, is it going to be those original three releases that people chase? I think this is a speculation trap. I think there's going to be some quick flippers out there that have already started making money off those con exclusives because of the buzz that's around it right now. But I think once this book is released, the fact that it's already optioned, we've gone through this cycle before. If you remember Outcast with Robert Kirkman, that book optioned before it came out, had a 70,000 print run right off the bat. Books did sell when those trailers hit or the first the pilot episode hit. People were selling issue number one real quick, and then it just freaking it went like from up here down. There's gonna be a, if people are buying heavy in on this book. I think they're gonna be left holding because you can't unload that many books within that short amount of time that the heat's gonna be there. Also reminds me of the book Witches from 2014 with Scott Snyder, and that time we had Jack on art. This time we have Giuseppe Comincoli. I'm excited about this book from a reader perspective. I think it's going to be a fantastic story. But I think if you're betting on this book as a speculation book, something to buy a bunch of copies of and that you're going to make a bunch of money, you better be able to sell quick because everyone has that same mindset. Everyone knows it's optioned already. Everyone's going to be buying up copies of this book. And then eBay, the market is going to have undercutters, whatever you want to say. So me, I'm picking up a copy to read. I'm really looking forward to reading this book, but I'm stepping out of this on a speculation standpoint. Yeah, and I would agree with you, and I would even bring up one more point, Brian, kind of build off what you said. Um, when you get into indie speculation, right, when you buy into an indie book, what is that moment of profitability for most of us? It's the moment that a book gets optioned. Look at Gideon Falls. Um, look at Bitter Root. Yeah, there's, sometimes there's that second wave when you get like a director attached or an actor or something like that. But the big spike point comes at that initial option. You're not going to get that with this book because the book's been optioned before the release of the book. And here's the other thing. We get discussions going on in the community about the, just the fact of whether or not comic kind of influencers, I hate that word, but to, for lack of a better word, like ourselves, should be talking about books pre-FOC and what that does to the print runs. But the reality is there's nothing you and I could talk about this book that's going to do anything to the print run more than the fact that, that it's been optioned already. Yeah, I, this book, regardless, is going to have – we've talked about it, This book's going to have 100,000 print run easy. At least. It may have 200. And I think between two factors. Number one, the fact that I think a lot of – you said it's this is a speculation trap. Who falls into speculation traps? And this is no disrespect to these people. I love these people and that's why we want to help these people. But 
rookie speculators, rookie new speculators tend to look at something like this and go, well, it's a slam dunk, right? We're always looking for option books. This is an option book. And it's got a hell of a creative team. Yeah, hell of a creative team. A jock FOC variant that's gorgeous. So it seems like the easiest play in the world. But one thing that like my mother always taught me was anytime something seems too easy, yeah, it usually is. It's too good to be true. And our last book we're going to talk about during this FOC, before we get into those additional printings, of course, is Immortal Hulk number 26. Immortal Hulk number 25 looks to be a huge issue. Already passed FOC for that. But if you're looking to get a cool variant for it, our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, has got a fantastic Mortal Hulk number 25 variant up on his site right now, frankiescomics.com. Make sure you check that out. But number 26 looks to just have one cover right now, which I'm excited about. But tell us more about the actual book, Jack. Yeah, this is one of those books that when I when I look at the solicit for 26, I'm, it makes me more excited for 25. Um, because the solicit says he's got an underground fortress, he's got powerful allies, he's even got henchmen. He's got everything he needs to declare war on human society as we know it, the most dangerous man in the world. And Bruce Banner is just getting started. And then you look at that cover, a great Alex Ross art. You see basically all of these characters who have come into prominence throughout this Immortal Hulk series. I really look at this series and, and as kind of like the key reader buzz series of 2019, 2018. And uh, it's really kind of paced everything Marvel's done. And I'm excited for a new arc. And you mentioned the fact that like 20, it has, we see one cover so far. Now there may be more added, but it's one of those things where 25 is such a big issue and going to have so much attention. And the fact that FOC was just like what, Brian, last week? I wonder if 26 is going to fall under the radar of a lot of people. I wonder if it's going to have a major drop-off in orders. I kind of expect it to. And because it's the start of a new arc, anything could happen. We could have a first appearance. We could have a major event. It's the type of book that kind of gets my radar up for both speculation purposes, but even forget that, just from reader purposes. Um, I'm immediately hooked and interested in reading this issue. As I honestly, if I'm being honest, I kind of have been every Immortal Hulk issue, but this one just in particular seems to be one that you kind of can't miss. Al Ewing's killing it, and he's done so well on this series that now he's taken over the Guardians of the Galaxy from Donnie Cates. And while previously that might have been looked at as like a big step down, I think now I look at that and I go, well, I can't wait to see what Al Ewing's going to do with that book as well. Yeah, I've definitely been. A rejuvenated fan of Al Ewing. We've talked about it before, especially kind of around Avengers No Surrenders when I started really keying on him again from, from his author. But Immortal Hulk, fantastic run. We've seen Hills and Valleys um, kicked off kind of slow burn, which is great because it had that reader spec to it. It went up, peaked. Everyone was buying every Immortal Hulk, all those back issues, all those different printings. Kind of slowed down a little bit. I think 25 is going to change that again. Huge issue. It looks to be in number 25, but 26, like you said, could be a sleeper pick. It'd be interesting to see if people pick up that climax on picking these up again from 25 and they go after 26, or if it falls under the radar to some people. Who knows? Great story nonetheless, and if you aren't reading Immortal Hulk, definitely, definitely, definitely go back and pick up the trades, if not the floppies, and read it, because I guarantee you'll enjoy it. With that being said, as we always do after we give our 10 picks for FOC, Jack tells us the additional printings for comics that are coming out. That's right, Brian. There are some more books hitting the FOC list at the last second, these additional printings of some very popular issues. And we're going to start off with Boom Studios. They pulled a fast one on us, and even though they said it was the last printing, we have once in future, number one, the seventh printing. We also yeah, have at this point, it's going to be like future and future. <laughs> yeah, right. We also have Something's Killing the Children, number one, the fifth printing, and we thought the fourth was supposed to be the last. And Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel Hellmouth, number one, the third printing. Marvel's got a little bit of a lighter week than usual this week as they come in with Absolute Carnage, Immortal Hulk, number one, the second printing. Ghost Rider, number one, the second printing. Immortal Hulk, 24, 
the second printing. And finally, New Mutants War Children number one, the second printing. And they've got a Sienkiewicz variant there. Right. So also it's important to remember all the comic books that we talked about with our picks and those later printings that Jack just announced. If you're interested in any of those, make sure you get your orders in to your local comic book store before Monday night at 10 p.m. That's when Diamond has the final order cutoff. And as always, if you're interested in seeing the full FOC list, we're not even just talking about comic books. If you're into trading cards, if you're into toys, the full final order cutoff list, head over to simplemanscomics.com and we have them up there for you to see. And with that being said, I'm Brian Wood. And I'm Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Remember, buy what you like, that way you'll always be happy with your collection. I was starving, now I'm mean to my belly flow. From up north, we get cold, you need a heavy coat. Scared to end up on a shirt before a centerfold. Devil on my back, target on me, deli toe. Play for keys, don't tweet. It's not peace, don't speak.